Good afternoon, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar, Critical Steps in Establishing Literacy Programs Based on the Science of Reading. I'm Alexis Pokna, the director of the Winward Institute, and it is my great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's presenters. Dr. John J. Russell is the Associate Director of the Haskins Global Literacy Hub at the Yale Child Study Center and Special Projects Advisor to the Winward Institute. He is the former Executive Director of the Winward Institute and former Head of School at the Winward School. He has over four decades of experience in education, particularly in school leadership, with a focus on language-based learning disabilities, research-based instructional practices, and organizational theory. Dr. Danielle Gomez is the Research and Outreach Director of the Winward Institute, as well as the host of the Read podcast, currently listened to in over 130 countries. She has over a decade of experience working as a research practitioner and teacher, most notably working as a middle school classroom teacher at the Winward School. She is steadfastly committed to translational science, organizational change management, literacy, and child development. Thank you all for being here. You're in for a treat. Thank you, Alexis. It's great to be here. Um, I just need to add a few little pieces to my background that I think are germane to this presentation. Um, I spent the bulk of my early career, not in public schools, uh, as a teacher, as an assistant principal, uh, as an assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction, and finally as a superintendent. And during that time, like most of you, I presume, uh, I tried to stay current uh, with what was happening in the field. Uh, but the day-to-day -day demands uh, of, on all of us was such that it made it really very difficult. Uh, and what I was exposed to uh, was a combination of popular press and uh, magazines and articles in uh, lots of different venues. But the bottom line was, like I think most of you, uh, I became quite enamored when I was an elementary school principal with whole language. Uh, and then as whole language started to take some lumps uh, from commentaries and criticism, uh, and I moved in my career to assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and superintendent, I moved over to a, a balanced literacy approach. Uh, as I look back on those times, uh, I feel compelled to share with you that I have gone through the same process and the same evolution, or at least a similar one, that I think many of you have. And that's the genesis uh, of this presentation, because as I look back, I said, you know, what can I provide my colleagues who have gone th are going through a similar evolution that I went through that will help them on the journey? And that's what this presentation is about. So I hope you find it informative. Uh, I need to start out by um, sharing with you a story that I found quite compelling and, and very much analogous to what's happening in our field in education. Uh, and it's one that happened uh, in 1881. And uh, this delightful picture is a monograph by Courier and Ives. Uh, and that poor gentleman uh, who is the subject of all of these stares from a, a variety of people uh, is the soon to be deceased President Garfield. And the reason I wanted to bring this story to light is because I do think it's what happened in the medical field is very much analogous to what's happening in our field. So when President uh, Garfield uh, was shot, it was a hot, hot day uh, in Washington, D.C. in July. And that's when Washington, D.C. absolutely really was a swamp, uh, literally, literally. And Garfield decided that he was going to take his family out of Washington to the Jersey Shore. And in order to get to the Jersey Shore, he had to go to the train station in Washington. And while he was there, and he's on the platform, uh, a disgruntled and possibly mentally ill uh, man uh, named Charles uh, Guiteau uh, broke through the crowd, 
and shot Garfield. And they immediately brought in, uh, while he's laying on the platform, they brought in a, 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 a someone who was an expert on gunshot wounds who happened to be in the vicinity uh, miraculously. Uh, and he had the also quite unique name of Dr. Willard Bliss. Doctor was his actual first name, and he also happened to be a doctor. Uh, Dr. Bliss uh, did what he had been taught to do and immediately began to probe for the bullet. And with his hands unwashed, with Garfield laying on the ground, he probed and probed. They couldn't find the bullet. They took him back to the took Garfield back to the White House. Uh, and they brought in multiple doctors who also, without washing their hands, began to probe for this bullet that was eventually going to cause Garfield's death. Now, what's interesting, and here's where the analogies, I think, play out. By this time in 1881, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch had already demonstrated the germ theory of disease. So they knew that germs cause disease. And Lister uh, in England had demonstrated unequivocally that if you washed your hands between uh, doing whatever it was you were doing and performing surgery, uh, the a percentage of people who it became infected as a result uh, declined precipitously and the death rate also declined precipitously. So despite that information being around since the 1860s, these doctors continued uh, in the practices that they had been taught in what was then passed for medical schools uh, because that's what they had been taught. Uh, and in fact, interestingly enough, even today, and this is this last bullet, 20%, uh, less than 20% of physicians uh, actually use uh, this, have do solid research uh, in their practice. So physicians rely heavily on the art of medicine uh, and not necessarily following the solid research evidence, much like we find ourselves today uh, in educational circles. So this sculpture also struck me as being an important uh, demonstration of what happens, what happened to me and what happens to many of us. On the uh, left-hand side, you can see uh, the sculpture encased in this steel, uh, it's this person encased in steel, much like we're encased in the education uh, that we received and, and the ideas that we have been taught in our pre-service and even graduate school. And it's very hard to break away from those practices and theories that we were taught even though the science involved in the science of reading continued to evolve, it was it's very difficult to move forward. But you can see that uh, as the sculpture depicts here, uh, with effort, uh, we can do that. And in the end, as in the figure to the extreme right, uh, it's extremely liberating. So I hope that sets the tone for this afternoon's uh, presentation and webinar. In fact, it's extremely important because, uh, and this is part of my motivation, uh, like a reformed smoker, I want everybody to stop smoking now that I'm a reformed smoker. And like a former believer in whole language and balanced literacy, I want everybody to be able to move comfortably without guilt from balanced literacy from a whole language perspective uh, to the science of reading. And, and it's extremely important to understand that this is not just uh, a choice that you make and one is as good as the other. Uh, as Mark Seidenberg has pointed out in his book, uh, Language at the Speed of Sight, which if you haven't read it, I commend it to you. Uh, the practices that are in place, just like the doctors who were probing Garfield, that those fingers in Garfield's wound weren't 
just benign efforts to solve and fix a problem. They actually caused the sepsis that killed Garfield. And similarly, our best efforts, based on what we learned at the time as what we thought were good practices, they inadvertently place many children at risk for reading failure. So those are the themes that you're going to see uh, that we'll cover as we move through today's presentation. So uh, picking up on Seidenberg again, this is one of the quotes that I love, just so we have the understanding that we're not alone in terms of moving from wherever we were in our understanding of the science of re reading to actually embracing and being able to implement the science of reading. Uh, the term Mark uses, despite the fact that the whole language and balanced literacy have received resounding criticism for years and years and years, and they have an afterlife that continues beyond their criticism. And he refers to them as theoretical zombies that roam the educational hallways. And many of us have seen these zombies in classrooms today with dedicated conscientious teachers who haven't been exposed to the science of reading are still using uh, practices, instructional practices that were based on whole language. So let's move to the agenda for this morning, uh, this afternoon's uh, webinar. We're gonna start off with a, a a really simple view of why is this necessary? And that is underscored by the state of reading at the global, national, and state level. Then we'll move to a brief discussion about how to lead change uh, in on, on large scale. Uh, and we're gonna use the concerns-based adoption model that was developed at the University of Texas as one example of how you might use change. Uh, and then moving on to charting the path for forward for SOR, uh, we're going to clarify terminology, talk about teacher preparation and professional development. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of screening and continuous progress monitoring, curriculum instructional practices based on science of reading and adoption of the science of reading. And then uh, my colleague, Dr. Gomez, will uh, be presenting on translating the science of reading into practice. And the last section will be devoted to the fact that uh, it's impossible to go this alone. All of us need support and partnerships are absolutely essential in this monumental task of introducing and adopting the science of reading. So let's start with the why. Why the science of reading, why now? And the answer to the why question is really, in my opinion, very clear in the data. Uh, and, and there he is. Uh, that's data from Star Trek, but the quote is from uh, Edwards Deming, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So anecdotal uh, information and stories are enriching, but it's data that will just drive decisions in a much more meaningful way. So this is a, um, a pictograph of what we see in terms of the PISA results, which is the program uh, for international uh, instructional uh, evaluations. And on this, you can see, and this is the uh, uh, combination of the math, science, and reading portion of the PISA test. It's given every three years to 15-year-olds. Uh, and what you see here is despite the United States spending billions of dollars, despite the concerted efforts of hundreds of thousands of teachers and students, uh, the United States still is 18th in the world on this measure. Uh, given the amount of resources we invest in education, we're number one in the world in that, you would think that we would be number one in results on an exam like the PISA, but unfortunately, we're not. Now, that's a worldwide uh, examination, and there's a lot of uh, 
discussion about the fact that countries like Singapore and Finland are much more homogeneous than we are. Uh, and that's why they do better on these tests. However, we have our own tests that we use. One of them is the National Education National Assessment of Educational Progress, now referred to as the NAEP and colloquially as the nation's report card. This is the results. These are the results from the 2022 version of the test. And I point out that the um, percentages of students here are below the proficient level. Proficient, quick and dirty definition, you'll be able to read a textbook and understand more than just the literal meaning. You could draw inferences from what you read. Obviously a critical skill in terms of comprehension and absolutely necessary to move on beyond elementary school and into secondary school and post-secondary school education. Unfortunately, as you can see in this graphic, uh, in the United States, this is nationwide, 67% uh, of all students were below proficient on reading ach uh, achievement. Now, at the Winwood School, uh, we have students who have been diagnosed with a language-based learning disability, pr primarily dyslexia. And the number you see here for students with disability is disabilities writ large. So it's not just language-based learning disabilities, but in a, a reasonable estimate is 80 to 90% of students with disability are in fact kids with language-based learning disabilities. And you can see the outcomes here are absolutely horrendous. 89% of fourth graders with disabilities are below the proficient level. Well, what about what happens if they have four more years of instruction given the current instructional climate? Unfortunately, things actually get worse. In all students in eighth grade in the United States, 69% are below proficient. And students with disabilities, 91% are below proficient. If you're below proficient and you can't read at the at that level, moving into high school, your chances of successfully managing high school curriculums, even less rigorous ones, are significantly diminished. So this is catastrophic information for our students. And this is despite the billions of dollars we've invested, the countless hours of dedicated teachers trying to educate kids and, and teach them how to read. So, Let's look at this from just one more perspective in terms of the NAEP. If you look at states and jurisdictions in 2022, zero states had a lower percentage of students that were below NAEP than they did in 2019. 22 had the same or no significant change. And 30, 30 of the jurisdictions and states and, and jurisdictions, Puerto Rico, uh, and the Virgin Islands. So it's 30 of those states actually scored less than they did in 2019. Now, right away, what comes to mind is, well, that was the time when COVID affected learning. Uh, and no doubt that had uh, a, a negative effect on teaching and learning. And that is true, but it is not fully uh, responsible for this disastrous performance. And you can see this pictorially in this graphic. These are the same numbers, zero, this is from tw the difference between 2019 and 2022. And you can see here that zero schools improved, 22 remained the same and 30 uh, decreased. Well, if we look at 27 to 2019, pre-COVID, you see a very, very similar pattern. And in fact, only one state had improved and that's Mississippi. Uh, and that would be the subject of a full webinar in and of itself on how Mississippi managed to embrace the science of reading early on and begin to get the results that you see here where they actually improved on the NAEP. But all of the other 
states and jurisdictions, they either remained the same or actually decreased. So what does this look like in terms of uh, a scaled score and from tracking it from 1992 to 2022? And I'm gonna do this rather quickly that we could delve into this in much greater depth, but not in this forum. So in 2022, the raw score was 20, two, 217. And excuse me, uh, in, 20, in 1992, it was also 2017. So in those 30 years, we have shown no improvement in the percent in the scale scores of fourth graders on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, looking at reading specifically. In eighth grade, we see similar results. Now, Winward, I realize that uh, people are joining us from different states and different countries this afternoon, uh, but the, we're in New York, so I took the liberty of, uh, of comparing how New York State did to the national averages. And what you can see is that New York State here is in the gold color. Uh, the national scores are in black. And what you see very clearly is New York State was doing slightly better, uh, actually significantly better, uh, until 2019. Uh, and then New York State in fourth grade, the performance declined uh, rather significantly. And once again, from, 20, from 1998 in this case, not 92, 1998 to 2022, the score actually decreased uh, the scale score for kids with um, uh, on the fourth grade reading portion of this test. And similar results for the eighth grade. Uh, once again, New York is in the gold, the nation's in the black, and you can see New York State did a little bit better than the nation uh, national average uh, on scaled score for eighth grade on the NAEP reading. New York State also gives uh, uh, this information by percentages of kids who are scored above rather than just scale score. And it's a little bit easier to digest, I think, than the scale score because this makes it really clear. These are the percentages of children in fourth grade who scored below proficient. 71% of New York State students in fourth grade scored below the proficient level on the NAEP. And in eighth grade, it's 67%. And again, as we go back and forth, you can see from 1998 to 2022, no change uh, in the percentage, while there were variations in between and similar results for eighth grade. So New York State and the nation, fourth and eighth grade, we have a clear red flag of difficulty on children learning to read. So let me pause just for a second and let this information sink in. We're, we have invested billions of dollars between 1992 and 2022 in education. We have ad, had used programs like whole language and balanced literacy. And these are the results that we have seen with virtually no change or improvement over the course of 30 years. So in my opinion, it's time to look at an alternative and to find out why that is and what we can do to change those horrible, disturbing results. So what does it take to lead a science of reading initiative? Because that, in my opinion, and I think the research supports this resoundingly, is the key to changing future NAEP scores and producing proficient readers at fourth and eighth grade in this country. So one of the things to be aware of as we begin this is that when we're asking organizations to change, it's a complicated task. And there is numerous studies and uh, research projects on how to institute change across organizations. One that I am particularly um, fond of is the concerns-based adoption model. 
It was developed by Gene Hall and his colleagues at the University of Texas. And it focuses on three aspects of change. First, stages of concerns, which is the feelings that individuals involved in the change, what are they going through in terms of their individual feelings? The second piece of it is level of use. Uh, I've heard many people uh, in many different schools say, oh yeah, we use uh, the science of reading, but to what degree and level do they use it? So this is how uh, levels of use refers to how individuals relate to a new program that is adopted. And the last is innovative configurations. Since we're not at that stage with the science of reading, we're gonna leave that particular sub uh, section for another time. So let's delve a little bit deeper into stages of concern. And basically what Hall and his colleagues have determined is that people move through stages. Uh, and the stages start at the lowest level is a focus on self, and then they move to a focus on task and then on to results. And I think it is a, make this a little less busy. We can just take the bottom half of that graph. So as you begin an initiative, like introducing the science of reading in a school district or a school, you need to be aware of what's going on. Some of us who are informed think everybody's aware when they're not, and we skip this step. So we have to be very clear that we have to provide our colleagues and parents with information that raises their awareness, what is the problem and what exactly is the science of reading? And that exactly part is a little bit sketchy, uh, not sketchy, but it, it's more encompassing and it's not a simple answer. And then after they're aware, but only after they're aware, can we begin to provide them with information about how uh, an innovation, in this case, the science of reading, <laughs> excuse me, would work. And then that information leads people to ponder, well, how does this impact me? And how am I able to do it? What's my self-efficacy, basically? And then, then, and only then, can they move on to decide and to focus on the task at hand? How do I manage and where do I get the skills? Now, frequently, professional development jumps in at the information level and the management level, skipping over the awareness, information, and the personal. We can't do that. We do that at the uh, risk of not having the uh, innovation uh, adopted successfully by all of our colleagues. So once they have focused on the management, then they look at consequences, collaboration, and finally on refocusing. So again, this is a very quick introduction to this, but the point is when you introduce change in any organization, it's not an event, it's a series of events, it's a continuum, and people move through that at different paces. And as the people leading these initiatives, we need to be aware of where our constituents are and to provide them with the information they need for each one of those stages and the, their concerns about the adoption. Then there's levels of use, and this is a very busy slide, uh, but as you can see, it goes from non-use to renewal. And again, we'll take a quick look at this. Uh, non-use is just what it says, I, I, I'm not using it. Orientation, that's where people go through the process of saying, no, I'm learning about it, excuse me. The preparation, they actually begin to get information about how to use it. Mechanical, they can now use it, but it is, uh, it is difficult for them uh, and they need more practice. With practice and experience, it becomes routine. And as it becomes routine, then they begin to make refinements and then the final two stages, they integrate it into their larger efforts, uh, and then they begin to look at, well, how has this innovation evolved during the time that I was at non-use to now? And they begin to renew uh, and reestablish the in in innovation. 
So those are the levels of use. So those, uh, that model, the concerns-based adoption model is only one, but I think it's a good uh, basis for underscoring the importance of realizing where individuals are as they move through uh, uh, adopting new practices that are dictated by, in this case, the science of reading. So what exactly do we have to do as we chart a course towards the path? So the first is to clarify terminology. Uh, and one of the things that we've seen bandied about very frequently is the use of scientifically uh, versus evidence-based. Uh, and the actual origin of this terminology in education came about with no child left behind. Uh, where the U.S. Department of Education actually defined scientifically based and evidence based. The difficulty for teachers, myself included, it wasn't until my doctoral studies that where I was expo exposed to information about exactly what was meant by scientifically based and evidence based. I had a, uh, like all of us, I had a general idea of what it meant to be scientifically based, and I thought I understood evidence-based, but frequently, I inter, inter, I thought they were interchangeable, and they're actually not. There is a very important difference between the two. So as we move our constituents, parents, teachers, uh, administrators, uh, all of our constituents through the process of adopting the science of reading, it's really important to remember that the use of these terms have been bandied about and different uh, people have different understandings of what these terms mean. So we should, we should definitely clarify them and look for definitions. So scientifically based, uh, this comes from the work of Whitehurst in 2001, which was part of that effort from the uh, federal government when they introduced No Child Left Behind is reliable evidence is actually in a hierarchy. And the gold standard is randomized control uh, trials with statistical analysis. Uh, many, many publishers will put a stamp on their reading materials that says scientifically based when it has not been, un it has not undergone the rigors of a randomized control sa uh, trials. Because randomized control trials, by the way, are extremely difficult to do in an educational setting. Uh, and then these other four different types of research are also scientifically based. They, as you move down the column from randomized control trials through quasi-experimental studies, correlation studies with and without controls, uh, and finally, case studies, the reliability and the validity begin to be uh, compromised. And most importantly, your ability to generalize decreases as you move down. But all of them have a, a rationale for being termed scientifically based. So a case study uh, is a great example of what is used in educational settings so often uh, somebody will do uh, something in a classroom, document what they did in a classroom, document the results and say, oh, this is what I did. Well, I, the fact that they got excellent results in that setting uh, does not mean that they can generalize from that and apply it across multiple settings. And all too often, that's what's happened. It's certainly what happened in, in whole language uh, and also in um uh, balanced literacy, where a lot of the information that was supporting this was case study based. Not good way to generalize. Evidence-based is different from scientifically based. So in a randomized control uh, trial, a scientist actually controls virtually everything that goes on in that trial. When you take that and put it in a classroom, as we all know as teachers, that changes. 
And so things need to be tweaked slightly. Those little tweaks of scientifically based programs result in evidence-based practices. So evidence-based practice is the, com as Whitehurst described it uh, in the second bullet here, he describes it as the combination of a professional wisdom that is based on personal experience and the best empirical evidence. All too often, like the physicians who actually killed Garfield, uh, their professional personal experience uh, dictates what's done as opposed to personal experience based on the best empirical evidence. So scientifically based, evidence-based, both important, both valid, but evidence-based is really crucial because it is a way of translating scientifically based practice into classroom practice that teachers can actually use. The science of reading, we need to clarify that term. It is not a single program. It is not a particular way of teaching. It is an accumulation of evidence for the last at least 30 years from a variety of fields. Uh, it's from linguistics, it's from cognitive science, it's from neuroscience. Uh, it is all of that information that is being distilled. So when people say this is the science of reading, uh, they are undoubtedly misspeaking. Uh, it is decades of information that is based on research about how students learn best and what methodologies, teaching methodologies work the best. It's not a single methodology. It's not a single program. It can be many different programs, but they have to be consistent with the research that comes to us from the science of reading. And this is an important statement by our colleague, Tim Shanahan, because often people say, oh yeah, this is the science of reading and it's not. It's not okay. It's dishonest, false advertising, fake news. Uh, and what Shanahan didn't say, but what Mark Seidenberg did say, it can actually produce negative results. It's not, oh, it's just another way of doing it. It's not, it's harmful, just as probing into a wound with dirty hands is harmful. Okay, so what we clarify terminology, what's the next thing we need to look at? Well, it's the, um, it's the preparation that pre-service teachers have and the preparation that current teachers have. And unfortunately, this is from a paper that was produced, uh, just recently uh, published uh, by uh, our colleague, Dr. Soleri and about 40 other researchers. Uh, and the key statement I have uh, highlighted in gold, that there's a profound gap that exists between empirical findings and the implementation of evidence-based practice in the assessment and instruction of, re, uh, of reading in school settings. And the, the reason for that profound gap is there's a profound gap between what's taught in pre-service and graduate service educational programs to our teachers and pre-teachers uh, that between what we now know, the science of reading, tells us is good practice. So, and it's uh, a lot of people are shocked by this, but this comes out of the work done by the National Council of Teacher uh, Quality of Teacher National Quality National Council of Teacher Quality, NCTQ. Uh, most states still don't verify that elementary, early childhood, or special education candidates know the most effective way to teach our, children, our students to read. Uh, as a parent, uh, that's shocking. Uh, as an educator, it's shocking. And we can see how this plays out. Uh, more than half the states have weak licensing. Uh, half the states do not provide specific guidelines for teacher prep. So if you're a college uh, and you're offering pre-service education programs for your students, 
you're not being told from the state or um, state education associations exactly what you should include or not include in your pre-service programs. Uh, and 19 states take almost no action in what's referred to as the five policy areas. And those are the big five that we've seen before. Uh, it's phonemic awareness, it's phonics, it's fluency, it's comprehension. So less than half the elementary teachers reading licensure tests require uh, core components in scientifically based reading instruction. Only 11 states uh, require special education. The kids who need it the most, the teachers who are working with the kids who have the most difficulty learning to read, don't require their special education teachers to uh, know the principles and practices that are embedded in the science of reading. Uh, and unfortunately, New York State has one of the weakest uh, teacher certification exams. It's a multi-subject exam where you can be uh, fine in some aspects of it and absolutely uh, weak in others. And in this case, it lists the phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, and vocabulary, uh, and still be licensed. So these, this graph, uh, I think, is a vivid picture of exactly what that means. And this is a picture that NCTQ put together of the percentage of programs that teach their pre-service teachers phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Comprehension. Those are the five pillars that we know uh, from the National Reading Power, uh, Panel in 2000 from their report are absolutely critical. The National Reading Panel did a meta-analysis of thousands of studies that affected millions of kids. And what they found was that these five components are absolutely essential for a good reading program. And yet, only 35% of the programs in 2023 uh, exposed the pre-service teachers to phonemic awareness, 58% to phonics. And you can see uh, comprehension 62% and fluency only 47%. Without all of those components in place, uh, the teachers will come with deficits in their repertoire of teaching skills. Now, this is the same thing, just uh, presented a little bit differently. 25% all five, 15% four, 11% three of the components, 13% two, 12% one, and shockingly, 25% of the pre-service programs that were surveyed, and it was a comprehensive survey, not all programs for sure were involved, but an extensive survey <coughs> of programs took place, and 25% of them, that zero, zero components were part of their pre-service program. And in fact, not only were they uh, neglecting the components that are required, they also were using uh, and teaching aspects of reading instruction that have already been debunked. Excuse me. <clears throat> For example, reading records uh, were part of over 30% of the programs. And all of these are in the right-hand column are the residues. They're the zombies that Mark Seidenberg were talking about uh, that still roam classrooms and they are left over uh, from whole language and balanced literacy. And they have been thoroughly debunked as being ineffective practices for teaching kids to read. And yet these schools, these pre-service programs are still teaching pre-service teachers to use them. As bad as that is, it's one thing to have book learning about phonics, phonemic awareness, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. But you need to have more than that. You need to have practice. And unfortunately, this is where schools of education in, this, in these surveys, these comprehensive surveys, really let down. And you can see 
uh, the, the on the, in the gold color are the percentage of, of schools that their students have no zero opportunities to practice the pieces of theoretical information that they learn. So where are we? First, New York State standards and tests for reading instruction, uh, they do not address the science of reading. Uh, New York State's elementary preparation standards do not address the science of reading. Now, I have to tell you, I'm personally involved on the state and New York City level. That's changing. It's changing in New York City, uh, thanks to the work of Chancellor Banks, and it's changing in New York State uh, thanks to the work of the New York State Legislature, particularly a Winwood alum, uh, Representative Legislator Bobby Carroll. Uh, and we are now in the process of revamping reading instruction, both in New York City and New York State. Uh, major, major undertakings, but long overdue. And you can see that from the results. Uh, by the way, if you want to dig deeper, you can break out uh, the results for your school district, if you're in the United States, any school district on the NAEP, uh, and similarly for New York City uh, and New York State, you can look at the uh, ELA results uh, for school districts uh, and schools. Okay, so what can be done about that? Well, this comes from NCTQ again. Uh, we need to bolster teacher preparation uh, with the science of reading. What about the teachers who are in place? These dedicated, hardworking teachers who were taught what they were taught, when they were taught it, and now the uh, information about effective practices has evolved, has been influenced by the science of reading. We need to give these teachers who have worked so hard, so long with our kids, the opportunity to learn these new this new information, new for them. Even though it might have been in existence for 20 or 30 years, it wasn't disseminated. So professional development that is based on rigorous, demonstrated, scientifically valid practices. Okay, um, another component, and I just, by, I should have mentioned this earlier on, I've highlighted four, com we've highlighted four components here. Uh, we could, uh, it necessarily dig a, a much deeper into this, but in an hour to cover 30 years of science of reading, uh, we had to pick and choose. So we've, we've chosen these four aspects, clarify terminology, strengthen PD uh, and pre-service education and implement early screening and continuous progress monitoring. So why do we need to do screening, early screening? This graph on the right uh, is very, Clear makes very clear, and this is comes out of the Florida Center for Reading uh, Research. Uh, you can see uh, in the far left, the blue bubble on the left is identifies students in middle of first grade who have, by screening, have been determined to be at low risk uh, for reading failure, and then the red dot were. Uh, are the students in the middle of first grade who have been high, at high risk. And you could see uh, if there is no intervention, the students who are at high risk, that red line by grade five uh, are two and a half years below grade level. Whereas if they receive intervention by being identified, you have to be identified and receive intervention. They're at 4.9 years, very close to their uh, classmates who are at low risk, who are at 5.2 after uh, five years. So this is but one of many, many studies uh, that demonstrate the importance and efficacy of early screening and early intervention. This is our colleague Maureen Lovett, uh, who did a similar study. And here again, you can see that earlier is better. If you intervene in first grade, uh, the level uh, at the end of first grade, the number of students who are moving ahead and the titles have gotten chopped off here uh, in these components, which was word reading, uh, fluency and comprehension. Uh, as they 
77% of the kids in first grade, if they received intervention, are at grade level after one year of intervention. But if you wait till second grade, those same kids, only 50%. And if you wait till third grade, only 38%. So uh, earlier is better. Uh, and we get greater normalization of reading scores if we screen and progress monitoring and intervene. Later intervention works. I don't want people to be saying, oh, God, what are we going to do? My child's in sixth grade and still struggling. It's never too late, but it's much more effective. Uh, and you get multiple effects uh, if you intervene early with screening and then intervention. So what does the screener include? This could be another more than an hour seminar by itself. So forgive me for being very brief here. Uh, but it should deal with these four characteristics, at least early print knowledge, alphabetic principle, letters, sounds, language, phonological awareness, uh, decoding and word reading skills, uh, and familial risk. There's a very high correlation uh, between uh, parents, uh, sisters, brothers, aunts, and uncles who had difficulty learning to read and the children of those, related children of those family members uh, anticipating similar difficulty. So these are some steps uh, that you can, that should be followed when you're considering a protocol. Uh, and again, just as the science of reading doesn't dictate a single program, nor does the screening protocol dictate a particular screener. Uh, there are many screeners that are available, uh, but they should have these characteristics. And the process uh, of adopting it should be a process, not a simple decision. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Dr. Gomez, who will be uh, moving you through the translation of SOR into practice. Danielle? Thank you, Dr. Russell. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, thank you for informing us, Dr. Russell. Whenever you speak, it is I always learn something new from you. And so I'm going to talk about translating the science of reading into practice. And for much part of my career, as Alexis had talked about, um, I've been a research practitioner, but I've also been a classroom teacher. And what has been so unique about my role at Winward is that I was learning about the research, connecting with the researchers, learning about the science, and also applying it into my classroom. And so I started to adopt this identity as a connector of science and story. And so as we moved into the application of the science of reading into school settings, I'm going to start with my story. All right. So um, Dr. Russell had shared some important insights, and I think it's important now to think about the individual here and connect with my story. So the story starts when I was about, you know, maybe right before uh, elementary school age, um, I was immersed in books growing up, thanks to my grandma and my mom. And um, I started to read books, but I wasn't reading, right? I was just memorizing the pictures. My mom would read the story to me and I would memorize the words so much so that my grandfather thought that I was a child genius by the age of four. And no, that's not a picture of me. It's just for dramatic effect. But what I learned there growing up as I entered my classrooms in kindergarten and first grade was that I was taught to look at pictures, to maybe perhaps look at context clues, memorize words, hmm, very different from the science of reading. And perhaps many of you resonate with that when you learn to read. And I tell you that story because once I started to um, study education, study reading in my pre-service, my graduate school program, I wasn't taught the methodologies that now have been informed and are consistent with the science of reading. So I started to divert to the methods that I too used when I learned to read. I just actually wanna give a special shout out to my mom because I, although I didn't learn uh, the phonics or science, the it practices consistent with the science of reading in my class, I think she was using phonics in the nineties. So shout out to Donna Scarano right there. Um, but. What, what I mean by that is, again, once I got into my graduate school program, I was not learning about the instruction consistent with the science of reading. When I became a teacher at the Winward School and I was um, immersed in explicit structured literacy instruction, I thought it was magic. I mean, I think that was my face like every year when I first started teaching at Winward. And as I started to learn and become more immersed in the science of reading, yes, there is a body of science. Um, as Dr. Russell talked about, decades of science, in fact, 
that inform instruction that's consistent with the science of reading. But what does that mean for the educator, right? Some people would say, okay, it's definitely not memorizing words and pictures. Of course, we all can agree with that. I'm sorry, Jack Black, but it's not magic. And while there is a large body of science, teaching it is not necessarily um, a scientific process, right? Some people would say in schools that it's complicated, right? And here we are um, in a lot of popular discourse trying to determine and decide and move through some of the change um, areas that Dr. Russell had talked about. But from an educator's perspective, and particularly for school leaders, the science of reading and implementing instruction consistent with SOR is this. It's understanding and looking at our curriculum. It's being committed to practice and instructions that are coherent and both consistent to um, better serve our students. So I'll dive into all those three C's, curriculum, coherence, and consistency as I apply the science of reading in schools. So let's first look at these components. When I conceptualize practices that are consistent with the science of reading, when we think about components of effective tier one instruction, and then even moving into um, other instructional practices of intervention through an MTSS framework, we're looking at curriculum. We're also looking at the coherence and consistency, particularly in how, uh, what, how it is being taught and what is being taught. So I'm going to dive um, deeper into the practices of how we're looking at instruction in our schools, and then particularly the skills that would be taught um, that are consistent with what the science of reading says about instruction. All right, so I'm actually going to switch my, um, my mic here, my monitor. All right, so as we approach curriculum coherence and consistency, I want to first focus on how instruction consistent with the science reading is implemented. So the how, right? And so I'm going to look at three components, explicit, sequential, and systematic. So what I mean by um, explicit, some examples, and actually I learned a lot about these with Dr. Devin Kearns when he presented at the Yale Child Study Center in the fall. But we talk about explicit is this is instruction provided by the teacher, that they're using this consistently through a model um, and practice um, through this very consistent instructional approach. Systematic, for example, reflects the entirety of a continuum of targeted skills, right? That there's enough lessons that are focusing on skills um, to be valuable. And particularly when we're focused on um, the early grades and even into the later grades, there's this focus on the foundational skills, right? That they're connected to standards or skills that are underpinning the development of reading. Um, and there's supports that are also implemented. Um, one of the researchers that I spoke to on the Read podcast, Dr. Shane Piasta, who's an expert in early child reading, said this. She said, we have strong and converging evidence for explicit instruction in teaching kids letter names and sounds, right? That providing explicit instruction, modeling, and giving child uh, children a lot of opportunities to say the name, to say the sound, and associate with the letter is an effective way of teaching young children alphabet skills. But let's dive even deeper, right? As we look into the how of instructional coherence, and particularly in looking at the consistency of instruction, again, we see explicit instruction that is well-designed, that's differentiated to fit the needs of students, that it's intensive and it's well implemented, right? So all of these pieces here have to be delivered by a, a teacher who is prepared to deliver to do so, right? Um, all teachers, I think, will work hard, want to work hard to provide this information, provide this instruction for students. It's now providing the teachers with similar PD that is well designed, that's intensive, and that's well implemented to prepare them. Here's an example of an explicit instruction model that we utilize at the Windward School. Um, it's based on research from a number of researchers, Archer and Hughes, Pearson and Gallagher, um, who outline the steps and what we might see in explicit instruction lesson. There's a clear objective for the lesson, focus on the foundational skills. We see this connection of background knowledge, motivating and engaging students in the lesson. And then there's this clear and explicit sequence of teaching modeling providing students with guided practice, feedback, and then um, a closure that's culminating and assessing what students need to know. Note here, particularly with reading, is that there's a gradual release of responsibility as students become more proficient with skills um, that they can become more independent with it. So what would this look like for an example, right? 
as Dr. Russell had talked about, the sci um, instruction consistent with the science of reading is not just one program. Okay, so, but what we hope to do here is arm you with information, prepare you to look for those programs that are going to be consistent with these findings. So one, uh, one um, really well-documented um, form of instruction is structured literacy. Um, Dr. Louise Spear Swirling has a number of articles, including a number of other researchers that outline these components. This is the one that um, I synthesized from her article. We see explicit, systematic, and sequential. Again, this idea of cumulative practice and review, high levels of student and teacher interaction, including teacher language and questioning and feedback, examples and non-examples of rules and patterns. We know that English um, is highly regular and when we're thinking about teaching language, right, and written language. Um, so providing those examples and non-examples, including uh, reading of decodable text, and then as I said, teacher feedback. And I just wanted to actually um, read a quote that Dr. Spear Swirling had said uh, when I was talking to her about the sci um, instruction and structured literacy. She said that leaders should be looking for programs that had a lot of explicit systematic teaching with a clear sequence of skills for teachers to follow, not just the common core standards. So if you're going to take anything away from that, it's that, right? That as leaders, we need to be much more versed and um, informed on the programs that we're choosing to support our children. So now let's get into the what of curriculum coherence, right? What are those skills that we should be focusing on in teaching our students? And I'm going to focus broadly on comprehension because as we know um, and informed by the science of reading that um, reading is as a result of our word recognition skills as well as our language comprehension skills. Um, for many of you that might be out there, you are familiar with Dr. Scarborough's reading rope. As we see here, the reason why I have it is because to show that reading development and consequently reading instruction is comprehensive, right? We have this integration of both word recognition skills and language comprehension skills. Even looking further, this is a um, graphic that the Windward Institute uh, team had created based on a number of frameworks that were developed, including Duke and Cartwright's, um, the LARC study, um, shout out to my language experts, um, Dr. Tiffany Hogan, Dr. Mindy Bridges, I think Dr. Piazza was also on LARC. Um, but what we see here is again, reading, is an integration, it's a comprehensive approach to a number of skills. Where we see in the elementary schools, things like um, higher uh, word phonological awareness and explicit phonics instruction, this focus on fluency. Nevertheless, we do see comprehension and language comprehension skills, vocabulary being important to both elementary and middle school. And in synthesizing the research, we also know that writing and writing are important when they are integrated. And there has to be this foundational focus on oral language and the executive functioning skills. So really important, I think this, this slide itself has a lot of weight and understanding when, particularly when we're planning instruction, when we're designing curriculum, there has to be a coherent approach to all of these skills. Um, and even for something like writing, right? That writing and reading aren't separated, even finding time for instruction, right? That you can leverage both in order to um, to infuse, uh, leverage both reading and writing to facilitate development in both reading and writing. So here's some examples of word reading, um, word reading skills and some uh, elements of explicit instruction from phonological awareness, decoding and sight recognition. Now notice again, we're not naming a program. These are examples of practices and I'm only naming a few again, but for you to be um, much more aware in those types of instructional examples. And then when we look at comprehension, now I'm personally very interested in the research that's coming out on comprehension and actually in fact, the decades of research that has continued to inform comprehension. But again, we see this coherent approach, this steadfast commitment to um, improving and facilitating uh, background knowledge, both building and activating, right? As well as continuing to build student vocabulary teaching things like text structure, um, as well as facilitating oral language. I talked about the reading writing connection, as well as bridging integrated skill and strategy development. Things like um, teaching summarizing um, to facilitate comprehension. Um, these are all different types of skills, foundational skills that when approached through a coherent lens can help to build comprehension. 
And in fact, there's research to support it. So this is just um, a, a slide that synthesizes four different studies, um, two meta-analyses in the elementary grades, um, Gabas et al. 2022, Huang et al. in 2022, that looked at effective programs that when they were there was this coherence in the elementary grades, these were all the skills that they had focused on to build comprehension. Now, there's less research on adolescents, but nevertheless, there is a body of research that supports adolescent comprehension. The Meadow Center, for example, Dr. Sharon Vaughn and her team are doing an incredible job in understanding adolescent comprehension. Again, we see this compre these comprehensive, coherent approach, background knowledge, this instructional simultaneity uh, tenuity that Dr. Nell Duke talks about in the science of early literacy, of this integration between skill and strategy and content. So I talked a little bit about the instruction, and of course, I could go for on for days. And in fact, we have a lot of professional development that focuses on these skills. But that just gives you a, a little bit of a flavor of this coherent approach to uh, instruction consistent with the science of reading. So when we look at students, um, and maybe these are students that are in tier one environments that are receiving good instruction, they still need more. So what does that mean for interventions? As Dr. Russell said, early screening is much more effective, right, in the early grades. Um, and that neuroscience research shows that the brain can change as a result of effective word reading interventions. When I started teaching at Windward and when I became way back in the day, the research associate at Windward School, I remember Dr. Russell sitting me down and saying, you as a teacher are a change maker. And I think any teacher on this call should like go out into the world and that should be your identity because when we are teaching students consistently with this word uh, science, consistent with the science of reading in word reading, we are changing their brains. And so we know from the research that earlier intervention is most effective. We know that there's an effectiveness of interventions that effectively target word reading and decoding skills, particularly with students with dyslexia that have these word reading skills um, uh, steeped in this uh, a deficit in phonological awareness. We should also consider supporting language and comprehension skills and then consider that uh, dosage matters. Repetition of skills and teaching matters, particularly for students who continue to struggle. And then finally, as we think about these instructional implications, of course, I talked about curriculum. I talked about coherence. It's important in any level of instruction, but we cannot leave out assessments and good diagnostic data. Um, in, in our, uh, we have a, uh, now it's an annual journal called The Beacon, um, where Jamie Williamson, the head of school of the Windward School and the executive director of the Windward Institute said that diagnostic teaching meets each students where they are and targets instruction accordingly. This involves continuous assessment, both formal and informal, to determine skills deficits to target for additional practice, right? So we cannot underscore the importance of diagnostic data. Here's the um, journal where it is. You could find the beacon on the windwardschool.org slash WI if you'd like to read more. And so there must also be this commitment to data-driven decision-making as um, as seen in this, this um, quote here, that data use is critical to alignment. There must be an alignment between data and instruction. And as Jamie had talked about, the answer is not necessarily more data, but rather better data. And in fact, I love data so much, Dr. Russell loves data so much that I wanted to return not only to, um, to uh, W. Edwards Deming that in God we trust, all others must bring data, school leaders right there. I love it so much, both in, from a data perspective in schools and data in the Star Trek universe. I think in this point, Dr. Russell and I are ready to join the crew of the Star Trek Next Generation or Picard. I don't know, you might see us on another, a future episode. But again, underscoring the importance of data. But in all seriousness, why does data even matter in schools? Well, the immediate answer is simple, right? We need to know what children will struggle, when children will struggle. And from a global perspective, if our methods of curriculum are even effective for supporting all students. So one um, example is why data is important is, of course, through universal screening, intervention planning, and progress monitoring. Um, it's really important. Dr. Hugh Katz um, was a Schwartz lecture here. We, he's a good friend of the Windward School and a really respected researcher in the field. Talks about pairing screening and progress monitoring with high quality instruction. Again, we see this coherence as well as then if students who, there are students who continue to struggle, who continue um, are at risk, 
lead, knowing when we make informed decisions for them to receive a formal evaluation and diagnosis. And, I would, and Dr. Russell, of course, underscore this point, right, that early intervention is critical for these students. So to summarize, I'll leave you with this. I commented about this in a paper that I'd written, and I think it's really important to synthesize that carefully planned screening, high quality instruction, interventions, and progress monitoring provide a roadmap to identifying and addressing risks before a child reaches failure. We need the systems that are going to effectively teach, track, and support, and truthfully empower students, both individually and across the systems, to not only to prevent them from failure, but to set every child up for unlimited success. I know we see it at the Windward School and it's our goal and vision truly to see this for all students around the world. And so there's a few things we want to synthesize for you in closing. This comes from a few uh, research briefs from the New York State Department of Education in 2023, actually their literacy briefs, I'm sorry, where they summarize the principles of structured literacy and uh, instruction, systematic and, and cumulative explicit and direct, responsive and authentic. I think the, the, the third one, all three of these are really critical. Um, and again, I mentioned differentiated, right? That they're reaching kids um, and they're personalized, that they're culturally and linguistically relevant and context-based. And then again, from our New York City State Department of Education literacy briefs, in synthesizing the science of reading, it reflects a body of research, it informs instruction for early childhood through adolescence for all populations. It's not, I, I cannot underscore this enough. The science of reading is not only for children in early childhood, extends through children um, and again, through all populations. It's, it's worldwide. Um, that it emphasizes the importance of structured literacy instruction. Um, it develops the big six skills and competencies. It reflects the importance of fostering a culturally responsive teaching environment. And then it approaches the way that we build literacy skills, but also um, in ensuring that we're cultivating social emotional skills as well. So what are these action steps that you can take in leading for literacy? As Dr. Russell talked about in, um, in, in earlier with the CBAM model, we need to build that awareness, understand the science of reading, as well as understand the relationship between the science of reading and the instructional features that are consistent with the science of reading, right? These two go hand in hand. Third, we cultivate the conditions through learning, through relationship building for adult learning and a collaborative planning and action, right? We create the systems for all children and adults to succeed. And then finally, we implement a system, and I shouldn't say finally, these aren't linear, right? These are all together. We should think about these all together, is implement these assessment systems for identifying student progress and needs. And we will leave you with this, that partnerships are essential. I talked about in the last slide and for action step three, when we're creating conditions for adult learning, we're also creating these relationships. And so we at the Windward Institute are so um, grateful to be in partnership with the Global, the Global Literacy Hub at the Yale Child Study Center, particularly in our in-school neuroscience project. We've learned so much from the Yale Child Study Center. Um, Dr. Russell had mentioned his work with the New York State Department of Education. Our head of school, Jamie Williamson, is also involved in those projects. And so these are pieces, these are just some examples of effective partnerships in place. We know that many colleagues, our colleagues at the Florida Center for Reading Research, at the Meadows Center, um, Middle State Tennessee University, I can name so many, um, MGH Institute, right, are all doing this work. And uh, we see that, th that partnerships um, continue to be an essential part of this process. So... As we close, Dr. Russell, I wanna thank you for leading this presentation and inviting me to join. Um, we wanna thank you all for being here on this webinar. I do wanna remind you that this was a small piece of learning and we, we encourage you to ignite that fire that you feel to, re to sign up more for some of our learning opportunities, including our Summer Institute and our literacy boot camps. You can find out all about our courses on the windwardschoolorg slash courses. And then finally, we wanna thank all of our colleagues at the Windward Institute, Jamie Williamson, Alexis Pokna, Harry Ramkishin, and Naja Frazier for your, um, your support and your planning and help on this presentation, as well as Dr. Russell. I'm so grateful for all the expertise that you have offered to us. And thank you all for joining here today with us and continue to engage with us. Thank you so much.